Today on the show, Nigeria's stock market ranks world's best performing stock market in 2020. More vaccines on the horizon as UK approves Oxford AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine for use. And we look at Kenya's economic performance in 2020 and outlook for 2021. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the program. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. Started off with the market and once again, Nigeria's stock market is being ranked as the world's best performing stock market in 2020. According to Bloomberg's tracking of stock markets, the domestic bourse recorded the highest return among 93 equity indices, posting its best annual return since 2013 after rising to 45.7% this year. Analysts attribute the latest feed to investors' appetite for riskier assets, which have remained strong due to persistent low yield in the country's fixed income market. In January this year, Nigeria's stock market was ranked as the world's best performing equities market after gaining 600 billion naira in seven days before falling several places behind. It later reclaimed the top spot in October after extending a 12-day rally and recording its highest surge in five years. And for intraday market numbers, the Nigerian stock market, of course, was already on steroid at intraday, up 1.24% at midday. The Jersey index in South Africa was also positive at 0.38%. In Egypt, the EGX30 was also up 1.18%. The Nairobi Stock Exchange closed Wednesday on a positive note as well. In the Middle East, it was more of red arrows at intraday. The Abu Dhabi index was down 0.21%. And um, Dubai down 0.28%. On the other hand, the Qatari index traded in the green up 0.33%, while Saudi Arabia was negative 0.03%. And European stocks traded slightly higher in the morning amid more positive vaccine news in the region. Let's talk to Ashutosh now. Good afternoon, Ashutosh. Well, the UK has just approved the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. How are the European markets uh, where you are reacting to this development? Well, Jimmy, good afternoon and thanks a lot for having me. Uh, yes, it's, it's the sort of a last hurrah for the market. Uh, the markets are trading in the green. Uh, as you can see behind me, the DAX is also in the green. And, and these are the last few minutes of trading this year. And, uh, and that's the message behind me about the welcoming new year already. So yes, it's definitely a positive news uh, as far as the vaccine is concerned. That's vac that is the vaccine which is being touted as the vaccine for the world. It's cheap, it's easy to move around, uh, it does not need any fancy uh, cooling uh, equipment. Uh, and, and that's the vaccine that could actually be administered to people in the more poorer countries. And, and that's the reason why it's so important. Today, even uh, there are reports about India considering to give it a go ahead, uh, the Oxford vaccine. So a definite positive because the markets do understand that for, uh, for all sorts of uncertainty to go away, it's important that each and every individual on this planet is safe from this virus. Absolutely. All right, let's look at other issues there on the wire. EU and China are poised to sign an investment deal. What do we know about this agreement? Well, Jimmy, the details are, are sketchy uh, so far. We really don't know uh, what all is there in that deal, uh, the details we are still waiting for. But so far, we know that uh, China has made some significant concessions to the EU. It's, it's a crucial market uh, for China, and it is looking to uh, make some inroads in some of the strategic industry where China is uh, currently, it's very difficult to actually uh, play in and so, so those in, uh, sectors like energy and also maybe China gets uh, some sort of an entry there. Uh, as far as European uh, companies are concerned, uh, they get uh, uh, some sort of those trade barriers that are to, uh, or the barriers that, that are there to foreign investments. Many of them are going to be lifted, especially in sectors like electric vehicles, health and financial services. That's a positive. But look, we've got to understand that uh, it, it's, uh, the EU is already fairly an open market or investment destination. It's the China which actually has more restrictions there. So the concessions are being made more by China here. But of course, there are questions about uh, uh, how they are going to comply with it. We've seen that they really don't uh, adhere to free trade norms when it comes to some sort of uh, geopolitical issue or bilateral political issues, as we saw in the case of Australia. So that, that's, uh, that's something to watch out for in the future as to how 
they are going to comply to this agreement. Perhaps that would be in the details. They've also uh, agreed to some, made some concessions as far as uh, adhering to norms of labor, uh, uh, adhering to labor norms as prescribed by the International Labor Organization. That's a, a big uh, positive. Then uh, more transparency for uh, subsidies, the state subsidies. That's been a problem that, uh, that the foreign companies do complain about not having a level playing field in, uh, in China. So there is going to be more transparency there as far as subsidies are concerned. This, uh, the state-owned enterprises are going to be disciplined further. So these are some of the things that are coming out and these are major concessions being given by China. But uh, critics are actually questioning the timing of it. They say that the EU is perhaps rushing and, uh, and by that they are losing their leverage over China by not working together as a unit uh, or, or as a, on a multi-level, uh, lateral level, perhaps taking uh, you, the U.S. on board because the U.S. wouldn't be very happy about this deal being rushed. But then this, uh, this has been a passion project for uh, German Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel and she would like to uh, get it done before uh, the German presidency ends, uh, of the, the European Council presidency ends. Now, who stands to gain more from this deal, the EU or the China? Uh, again, it's very difficult to say at this point of time. Like I mentioned, it's more, uh, when you look at the concessions, uh, it's the Chinese side which is making more of those concessions. And, uh, and that means that the European companies will get access and a more level playing field uh, uh, going forward to the, in the Chinese market. But then all will depend on compliance and, and, and the details of what the deal entails about how, that, uh, how all these compliance issues can be dealt with, how the, how the deal would be implemented in letter and spirit uh, and, and also the issues around uh, forced labor in China and all these issues would be, uh, we would remain to be seen that how uh, uh, the EU parliament is going to take up uh, because they're yet to sign this deal once it's approved and announced uh, and the, the European parliament would, would certainly try to look into how uh, the negotiators have done when it comes to uh, calling out China on issues of human rights is concerned. All right, Ashutosh, I guess we have just one more day to call it a year for 2020. So looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow. And okay. in the meantime, financial experts and business groups are welcoming the news that UK has approved the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine today. Well, Juliana will tell us more. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon. Well, in London, the FTSE 100 was up just five points this morning. Yesterday, it jumped up nearly 1.6% amid hopes that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine will soon be approved in the UK. So, does it mean today's good news of the approval has already been priced in? I think that's an appropriate analysis, uh, Chimaze. Yesterday, as you said, a huge rally in uh, the stock market here in London. £34 billion was added to the value of London-focused stocks. And that's really, as you said, because of the Oxford AstraZeneca um, vaccine, as well as uh, the post Brexit trade deal finally um, getting the green light. It's been an, a really amazing day. This is the second vaccine that has been approved by regulators in the UK. And we heard from Matt Hancock, the health secretary, early this morning. And we believe that it will start being rolled out to the population on January the 4th. I believe at the moment there's about 100 million doses, which means it is enough uh, for every adult living in the UK. Huge sigh of relief, as you know, uh, the rising COVID cases. Cases are becoming worrying. We are going to expect another statement from Matt Hancock later today in the House of Commons, letting us know uh, which parts of the UK will be going into the most extreme tier, uh, tier four. But as you said, there was a little bit of a subdued start to the FTSE this morning. I believe it was up by about 0.4%. We've had a little bit of a rally as we come to intraday. So intraday, the FTSE All Share is up 0.14%. The FTSE 100 is up by 0.23%. And the FTSE 250 up by 0.03%. In currencies, the British pound up on the US dollar by 0.62%, up on the euro by 0.39%, and up on the Japanese yen by 0.21%. Worth mentioning, Chimmy, as well, that the banks are the biggest risers at intraday. NatWest, Lloyd's, Standard Chartered, Barclays, all trading between 23 uh, and 2.7% up. 
Well, aside from the vaccine news, Brexit is another topic out there. And members of parliament are to vote today on the agreement for PM Boris Johnson. It's a historic resolution. But will this deal seal through the parliamentary approval? Oh, absolutely. It's going to sail through Parliament. Um, lots of people are unhappy about that. But we're just so close. Tomorrow, 11 p.m. is the end of the transition uh, period. We did get some pictures this morning showing the European uh, Council president, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, as well as... <clears throat> The European uh, Council uh, Commissioner, um, Charles Michel, signing that deal that was put on an RAF plane, scrambled over uh, to London. The debate's been going on since about 9.30 local time. We're expecting the vote at about 2.30, which I believe is in about two hours' time. It will then go into the House of Lords. They'll have to ratify it, and then it will go to the Queen for a royal assent. And then Brexit is basically uh, done. There are still so many critics one of them being former Prime Minister Theresa May. She's not happy with some of the contents of the deal. Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, the um, uh, opposition Labour Party leader, also saying that he is begrudgingly signing and voting for this deal. There are a few people that won't be voting for it, including the Scottish Nationalist Party, not happy um, that uh, Boris Johnson has sacrificed some of their fishing waters, as well as the Liberal Democrats, who uh, were pretty bruised in last year's general election election because they said they would be going for a second uh, referendum. But it does appear that after four and a half years of going backwards and forwards, lots of political infighting, family feuds, friendships breaking up, uh, that Britain is indeed going to no longer be a member of the European Union come Friday. Mm. And as 2020 draws to a close, Bitcoin is continuing its remarkable rally. The cryptocurrency has surged to a new all-time high today, bursting over $28,500 early this morning. Just wondering, Juliana, if you have a plan to invest in this market come 2021. <laughs> I'm not as wealthy as you yet, Chimaze, <laughs> um, uh, but I'm happy uh, to. I, um, <laughs> I am happy uh, to borrow some money to get my hands on a Bitcoin. Twenty nine thousand dollars is just absolutely extraordinary, especially if you think of the kind of um, regulation um, issues that Bitcoin have had over the years. It is the number one cryptocurrency. It's the first. It's had a stellar year. I think since the beginning of the year, its um, value has quadrupled. But over the past 24 hours, it has surged by up to 5.4%. Uh, and it really goes to show just how seriously the market are now taking digital currencies. There are so many of them available. In fact, even uh, Facebook are trying to get into um, uh, that pretty lucrative uh, market. But most importantly, I suppose this is going to show uh, where times are going um, in 2021. It's been such a volatile uh, period for the stock market that perhaps, who knows, digital currencies like Bitcoin could be uh, the new safe haven taking over uh, gold. Although that's not likely to happen in 2021, but uh, 2020 has been a strange year. So who knows? Well, perhaps 2021, we'll have to start that. Just um, with a third eye, looking at the Bitcoin. We'll see how it goes. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. And stocks in Asia Pacific were mixed today after major indices on Wall Street snapped their multi-day winning uh, streaks overnight. Meanwhile, the dollar weakened against other major currencies. Mainland Chinese stocks were higher by their close. The Shanghai Composite gained 1.05%. The Shenzhen Component advanced 1.65%. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index rose about 1.6%. Elsewhere, the Nikkei 225 in Japan slipped 0.45%. South Korea's Kospi jumped 1.88%. Shares in Australia slipped on the day with the S&P ASS 200 down 0.27%. And U.S. stock index futures were slightly higher in early morning trading on Wednesday as the market tried to reclaim record highs. Contracts tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 71 points. S&P 500 futures and Nasdaq 100 futures traded in mildly positive 
um, territory. The move came after the major averages closed lower on Tuesday, giving up early gains that pushed stocks to record highs at the opening bell. Both the Dow and S&P 500 snapped three-day winning streaks, each falling 0.22%. The Nasdaq Composite, meanwhile, slid 0.38%. And Kenya was once named the fastest growing economies in sub-Saharan Africa. But how did that economy perform in 2020? That's the conversation next. Well, just before we look at Kenya, for many economies, the coronavirus has been the defining challenge of the year. And from South Africa, Statistics SA announced the country's economy collapsed by an annualized rate of 51% in the second quarter, which rebounded in the last quarter. Now, the country's economic ability to recover from its longest downward cycle since 1945 has been dealt a blow by new restrictions to curb surging coronavirus infections. South Africa Reserve Banks announced uh, that the economy entered the 85th month of a weakening cycle in December. The country's economic growth has continued to decline irrespective of the attempts to reduce structural constraints. Economics reflect on the country's economy throughout 2020. Nine months into what has been described as the most challenging year for the world, thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, South Africa's gross domestic product GDP fell for the fourth consecutive quarter in mid-2020. The third quarter seemed more positive, but no one knows how the year will end. We asked the economists to take stock of the year. I think in the first quarter, we started off the year uh, with the budget speech, and there were various predictions made uh, by the Ministry of Finance. One of the important things we need to uh, outline is that from the onset, uh, we had a very low growth uh, trajectory of less than 1%. Admittedly, those contractions in uh, economic activity were not particularly serious, especially when compared with the dramatic decline that took place in the second quarter following the lockdowns, strict lockdowns that were adopted by the government to fight the COVID-19 crisis. Despite President Sir Ramaphosa's economic recovery plan, the country sunk deeper into junk territory in November when Moody's Investor Service joined Fitch ratings in lowering the country's credit ratings. Economists say there was no real economic leadership. So we literally spent six months of the year after COVID uh, lockdown without a clear economic strategy. And I think the recovery plan that was announced in October should have been more decisive um, in terms of dealing with the growth problems. I think uh, in response to that, we then saw in quarter four further downgrades uh, by the rating agencies, uh, this time Fitch and Moody's, putting us further into the junk status terrain. Within 2020, unemployment also rose to unprecedented levels, reaching its highest rate of 30.8% as 2.2 million jobs were lost at the height of the lockdown in the second quarter. So how bleak or bright could the outlook for 2021 be? From a statistical point of view, there's no question that 2021 is likely to be better than 2020. And that follows from the fact that the downturn that we experienced in the second quarter 2020 was terrific. And even with renewed restrictions uh, to fight the second wave, those restrictions are unlikely to be anywhere near as severe as they were uh, back in April, May this year. We're likely to contract, right, for 2021. If we don't change the methods and the economic policy tools and mechanisms we use, we're unlikely to deal with the current market failures. And they will be exacerbated because of the current economic shock that we haven't been able to come out of. While everyone looks to the leaders to fix all that's broken, the resurgence of an even higher wave of COVID-19 infections in the country may just throw a spanner in the works. And over the years, Kenya has been able to manage a sustained level of economic growth. According to the World Bank, Kenya's economic growth averaged 5.7% in 2019, placing the first uh, East African country as one of the fastest growing economies in sub-Saharan Africa. In 2020, however, the, the country is struggling to stay afloat. Several challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic, which started earlier in the year, crippled a lot of economies, including Kenya's. There was also the locust attack, which affected many parts of the country and had a negative impact on food security. 
George Bodo, CEO at Core Street Research and Analytics, joins me now. Hello, thank you very much, um, Mr. Bodo. Compliments of the season. Greetings from Nairobi. In 2019, Kenya was one of the fastest growing economies in sub-Saharan Africa. What was 2020 like for the economy? Oh, it was a very tough year for Kenya, actually. I mean, uh, uh, to be precise, the Kenya's economy was already on a, on a slowdown, uh, which, which traces back to 2015. And now COVID-19 just made things worse for Kenya. And you just need to look at uh, some of the key indicators. You look at, for instance, private sector credit growth has always been in the second digit territory uh, in terms of annual growth momentum over the last three years. Look at prices have been softening across the board. You just need to look at the core inflation. It's now just about 2%. Four years ago, it was at 5%, which shows you that there's been a lot of demand side weaknesses in the economy. And also look at the public finances, which were started being weak five years ago. Now they're even in complete disarray. So 2020 and COVID-19 has just made things worse for Kenya. And in, in quarter two, the Statistics Bureau said quarter two, uh, GDP uh, declined by 5.7%, which is the first time it declined in so many years. Mm. And I think even quarter three, quarter, quarter four, it will actually be, be softer. Now, Kenya is in talks with IMF for a $2.3 billion budgetary support. What's the fiscal trajectory looking like for Kenya post-COVID? Um, the fiscal trajectory of Kenya is looking so weak, um, to be honest. Um, the, the, let's start off with public debt, sir, which is going to accumulate almost half of pub, uh, government revenues. You have about half to, to divide between recurrent debt budget and development budget. You have revenues that are underperforming so far. The first six months' revenues are coming below target. Even in the, the next six months, which ends in June 30th, the revenue target is looking so bad. And, and the problem has been the payroll taxes because of uh, about 1.7 people, uh, 1.7 million people out of job. And those are, those are payroll taxes, income taxes that government is not going to collect. So it's looking really bad. I think the government has to continue borrowing to finance the revenues, which is why they're talking to IMF for some 2.3 billion uh, uh, budget and support. And what's your outlook for the banking sector? The banking sector outlook is looking so bad. So far, we have about five banks that have issued profit warning notices for 2020, actually, um, and, and some of them the largest banks. Um, and this is because, um, as the Zandu Bank statistics shows, that about 47% of, loan of loans have had to be restructured. If I add 46%, 47% rather, to the existing 13% uh, declared NPL ratio, we are looking at about 60% of loan performing in the, in, in the industry. And that's not good for their income status, which is why not a lot of them are projecting significant reduction in net income for 2020. And I think some of them would even project losses for 2020 and into 2021. And by the way, 2021 is campaigning period for Kenya. Um, to because 2020 is an election year. So you look at another year which production uh, output is going to be so negative. So it's not looking good for banks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, George Bodo. Uh, thank you for all your support all through 2020. We appreciate your time on this show. I'm looking forward to seeing you in 2021. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's always a pleasure. And that's a wrap on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimizi Obi Iwago.